Indians, while hunting, discover John Smith standing in shallow water. Indians agree to kill John Smith at the chief's seat. Pocahontas disagrees with the Indian men and makes no harm for John Smith but good wishes in 1607. Long before the English came to the New World to establish a permanent settlement at Jamestown, the Pamunkey people inhabited the inland waterways of present-day eastern Virginia. The Pamunkey, once numbering 10,000 members, were the most powerful tribe of the Powhatan Confederacy that occupied the Tidewater area. Unlike many native peoples, the Pamunkey were able to reach an accord with the emerging nation, which has allowed the few remaining members to continue to live on a small portion of the land of their ancestors, along the river that bears their name. As with most Indian tribes, the Pamunkey have a long tradition of pottery making. But like so many old ways confronting a changing modern world, the pottery tradition was starting to wane, that is, until a revival in the 1930s. Spurred by both anthropologists interested in Native American crafts and the need to make money during the Depression, Pamunkey pottery making entered a new era. In 1932, with the assistance of the Virginia State Board of Education, an on-reservation pottery school was built, and the Pamunkey Pottery Guild was formed to create pottery for sale to tourists. Its members helped preserve and invigorate this traditional art for more than five decades, as these scenes from the late 1980s show. The pottery clay comes from a nearby deposit that has been in use by the Pamunkey for at least two centuries. Before it can be used for pottery, however, the clay must be prepared. Dry clay is pounded into smaller, coarse particles and placed in water. The mixture is stirred and then sieved into a separate container to remove pebbles and bits of shell, common in this part of Virginia. This creates what is called slip, which is slowly poured into a plaster bat to set. When the edge is dry, Guild member Daisy Bradby easily rolls the soft clay off the bat, forming a rough mound or wedge. The clay has firmed and is now ready for use in shaping pottery. Dora Bradby, working from a block of freshly prepared clay, begins the base and first coil of a pot. Coil construction is a traditional method used by many pottery makers over hundreds of years. As each coil is rolled and added, Dora carefully seals both the inner and outer surfaces with her fingertips. Small clay modeling implements, as well as clam and mussel shells, are used to scrape and seal the walls of the pot and to create surface texture. Daisy stretches and rolls the clay into a long coil. The coil is set in place to widen and open the vessel she is making. The bowl is smoothed and turned upside down. A small kitchen knife is used to refine the base and outer wall of the pot. A damp sponge aids in the smoothing process. Daisy strengthens the surface using a small wooden paddle. In addition to coil-made pots based on styles produced by their ancestors, molded glazed ware was also produced and sold by the Pottery Guild. Bernice Langston skillfully applies layers of color to form the scales of a fish. This and similar small objects are fired in a standing electric kiln. When fired, pieces glazed in this manner produce vivid colors with a high glossy finish. This type of pottery, which also features pictographic designs telling the history of the Treaty of 1649 and the legend of Pocahontas and Captain John Smith, is referred to as pottery school wear. Irma Page and Willis Bradley concentrate on the final modeling process. With a wide, flattened coil, Irma elongates the neck of her pot. 
Experienced hands know how thin to scrape and finish the walls of the pottery to ensure it will survive the firing process. Irma incises a simple geometric design around the nearly completed pot. Almost classic in feeling, designs such as this are shared by Indian artists throughout the country. Daisy has adorned the neck of her pot with the head of a young Indian boy. Her fingers deepen the contours of the face and add details which create a distinctive personality. The hair is drawn using a wooden modeling tool. The final step before firing is burnishing. Dora works the surface of her pot with the tip of an antler. This process, depending on the size of the vessel, can take many hours. Willis refines the spaces between her incised designs with a flat-tipped modeling tool. Daisy has finished and burnished her pot. She rubs and polishes the surface evenly. A light crosshatch design has been added. On firing day, all the finished pots are placed in the sun to warm while Daisy prepares the fire. Only hard woods are used for this purpose. A rectangular brick kiln was constructed near the pottery. When the fire was ready, the pots were loosely filled with pine tags and carefully placed in the kiln. The pine tags ignite quickly, blackening and hardening the inside of the pots. Armloads of pine tags have been heaped over the pieces to be fired. Quickly, sheets of tin are placed over the kiln to contain the heat and smother the flames. The women of the Pottery Guild remain near the kiln to observe and check on the firing process. On this day, four and one-half hours have passed, but no exact time for firing can be calculated. Weather, time of day, and season are all a part of the process. A sense of anticipation accompanies the completion of the firing time. Dora is the first to take her pot from the still smoldering ashes as each in turn follows until all the pots are picked from the kiln and carefully examined. The color of the fired pots, referred to as blackware, is often surprising. Uneven firing can sometimes produce unusual pinkish clouding of the surface. Regardless, the differences in firing make each piece unique. This tradition of the Pamunkey people lives on in the works created by these elder women of the Pamunkey Pottery Guild. Today, a handful of their descendants continue to work in clay and affirm the deep connection that the Pamunkey Indians have to their land and to their heritage.